Hello, everyone. As you get settled in, uh, we're going to get started in a minute. I'm just uh, taking some time for everybody to get logged in and settled, and we'll be right back with you in about uh, I don't know, 50 seconds or so. Okay, let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Biz Essentials webinar. As most of you know, I'm Amy Stark, Director of Administration for FCSI the Americas. We're excited to have you here this month for a great presentation. Um, again, like most week, most months of our Essentials webinars, uh, have a couple announcements. First, please use the Q&A feature on your screen to submit questions if you have any. Um, and also, if you miss anything on today's webinar or want to rewatch, uh, remember that these are posted to our Biz Essentials uh, page on the FCSI, the Americas website, and on our YouTube channel. So if you wanted to subscribe to them on the YouTube channel, you'll be able to get access to them um, from there if you'd like to watch them later on. Um, also remember that since FCSI consultant members do have a CEU um, requirement. So three between three and 12 CEUs. Our Business Essentials webinars do count toward that CEU credit. You'll get one credit for attending one of our webinars or watching one of our webinars. So do keep that in mind if you're interested in looking back at um, past sessions. So for today, I want to first start with a very special thank you to Marco Beverage Systems for sponsoring today's webinar. And now I'd like to welcome today's presenter. Uh, Pamela Eaton has over 20 years of experience in food service consulting and design and an additional seven years of experience in hotel and restaurant food and beverage operations. As a project manager, she oversees all aspects of the food service facility design from programming through schematic design and creation of construction documents through construction assistance. So thank you, Pam, for joining us. Take it away. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so, so happy to be here. So uh, honored to, to have been invited to, to do this. Um, get this queued up. Hopefully you all can see my screen. Is it showing correctly? Yeah, uh, I don't see it. Don't see it yet. Oh, wait, maybe I've got another button to press. Hang on. Now you think you've got everything practiced. There we go. All right. So um, lead and the food service professional. What, um, what FCSI asked me to do was do a um, Kind of an intro to to lead to lead points and also to um, getting your accreditation and why it is important to to a food service professional and how this brings value to to us as a profession and to the others on our team. Um, so I wanted to actually go. So I wanted to give a little bit of background on LEAD, first of all. So LEAD stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. And it was founded in 1993, which when I was doing the math just seems like impossibly long ago, um, as far as years. It's LEAD, so LEAD certification for projects actually kicked off in 98 with the first version of LEAD. And the current version is is V4.1, and that was launched in 2019. And if you are on the LEAD online website, there are over 142,000 projects registered for LEAD certification. LEAD accreditation for professionals started in 2001, and the um, with the initial offering of LEAD accredited professional without the designation, and that was offered until 2009, and People who were who got the credential back in that period could keep their lead AP without any maintenance um, and can continue to keep that without maintenance. They don't get the um, 
the specialty at the end of their designation. As of 2009, they changed the um, offerings and now require continuing education hours for both the lead green associate and the lead AP. So the other things that I'm going to talk about today, I'm gonna to go over the difference between accreditation and certification, the different credential tracks, the certification levels, and then kind of circle back into food service, the other advantages of having um, a LEED certification, and then how LEED can help food service outside of maybe points specifically on the, uh, on, on the project's uh, score sheet. And then talk about all of the, just touch lightly on all of the other options for sustainability accreditation that have, that's developed since LEED started kind of started us all down the path. So one of the things that I found interesting with LEED is that they're very specific about people get credentialed and projects get certified. So um, there's, you know, so the, the terminology is, is very different between the two and there's some very specific things that go along with it. LEED was designed to create better buildings. And here's, you can see on screen the, um, the very sp the specifics, but what you'll notice is that it, the goals are well beyond just the reduced energy use that most of us think about when we think of LEED. You know, we don't really think the broader impact, but um, as the certification and credentials have developed, they are becoming much more encompassing, taking into account not just the energy requirements, but also the you know water resources and biodiversity and an overall quality of life. Within the lead certification for buildings, the um, the vast majority the, the majority of them well the the largest part is the climate is related to climate change and then it breaks down into other smaller parts. But again, you see where we're talking about biodiversity, we're talking about the green economy. And so it does look to reach out into all of the aspects that, that, a, that the built community can, can have an effect on. So when you're talking about lead accreditation, as I said, this is for people. Um, the current format, which was started in 2009, offers a lead green associate. This is the first step in the um, in your path, and it's a kind of a general informational step. It allows, it gives you an understanding all of the building principles and the practices. There is a, um, a multi-choice question, and there are fees associated with it. And there's also continuing education hours that are required. So it's 15 hours total over a two year period. And there is um, a renewal fee. And it is a prerequisite for the lead with the, with the designation. When you're looking at the lead with the specialty designation tract, you have to start with the lead green associate. Um, there is an option to do them kind of all at once or you can do it as separate pieces. This exam is also two hours long with 100 multiple choice questions. Um, they both require a 170 out of 200 to pass. Um, but you know, like these things, a one you know a 170 gets you the uh, the letters at the end of your name. So um, and it's not an easy it's not an easy test. And I would say that there are off, there's um, there are offerings for courses to help you do the test, and I would highly recommend them if you've not taken the test. I mean, if you, you know, if you're if you're looking at taking it, the um, the different accredit as part of the um, testing, you you do a deep dive into all of the different areas where the points are given for the building certification. Um, these are specific to. BD and C to building design and construction. But as you can see, um, there's a lot of them that are not food service directive. And so you'll come out of this uh, 
this learning curve, understanding and being able to talk about MER filtration levels, what, what levels are required during construction, what levels are considered safe as your starting occupancy of the building and what levels need to be reached prior to occupancy of the building. You'll learn about gray water versus black water, irrigation options, um, volatile organic compounds, just very, very wide range of information that is typically outside of our norm. So like I said, I, I highly recommend get, taking the courses because there's a lot of information and a lot of specific information required that you know, aren't necessarily part of our day-to-day -day life. Um, if you're an FCSI professional, you know, most of those things you run into on a regular basis, these are things that you're that will be will be definitely new to you. When we're looking at the accreditation tracks, um, there are five. The two that are the most that talk the most toward what we would be working with as far as designers um, are the building design and construction or the interior design and construction. And the big difference between the two is the amount of, um, of work within the kind of the, the physical. So the building design and construction is aimed at new buildings and at major renovations. The interior design and construction allows for um, a smaller renovation. Their, their points are more directed to, you know, th to the things that they can control. You know, when you're doing uh, B, D, and C, you have much more control over how you address the site, how you address transportation, how you address parking, um, things like that. Whereas the interior design and construction focuses more on, um, you know, waste handling and um, materials. You know, BDNC has those, but um, IDNC doesn't have some of the of the larger picture items that um, a renovate. You know, an interior renovation wouldn't have an effect on. Then operations and maintenance is another option. Um, I am honestly not as familiar with these, but I expect that somewhere within these, and the MAS um, consultants might be able to have some offer some assistance. And maybe during the question and answer period, if anybody's an MAS and has experience with this, they can weigh in. And then neighborhood development and homes. Within the um, within the BD and C, there's also some specific subtracts that are broken down. So schools, healthcare um, have some have some specifics that allow you to be, you know, again, a little bit more um, detailed as far as what your what your building is uh, is actually the purpose of the building. Then getting to the um, the project certification tracks, I'm sorry, actually the last comment would be for this for the building. So the project certification tracks are what the buildings are certified under versus these tracks, which is what people are certified under. The building tracks do mimic the, the personal certification for the first five. They have the BDNC, the IDNC, operations and maintenance, neighborhood and homes. And then they go, off, they have an additional one for cities and communities and for lead zero. And then you also, at, when you're, once you get your building certified, you have to recertify your building similar to having CEUs as, a, um, as an accredited professional. You need to show that you have, you're keeping up with everything that you started the building with, that the, the main maintenance is being done and that the, all of the systems are performing as expected. But so this is so within these certification tracks is where you can get into schools and hospitality and healthcare, um, and then IDNC is has retail and hospitality. For the different certification levels um, are platinum, gold, silver, and certified. The um, the latest. Um, version is 4.1, which was launched in 2019. I haven't heard much about a new update, but it does appear that um, platinum is becoming more typical where it used to be very atypical. And I expect that as more and more people are finding 
that the that the goals set out in platinum are are more typical goals that they will raise the bar once again because the idea behind the lead certification of buildings is that they are the top percentage performance of the buildings and so as the buildings keep keep getting better they are going to keep raising the bar which you know is the what you know was the very original intent to continuously raise the bar for for how we are treating the world we live in So as an example, one of the things also is the website for um, that USGBC offers ha is just an amazing resource. And there are there's so much information on it and it's definitely a rabbit hole. So be careful um, tooling around too much because you'll be lost um, in a good way, but still, still lost. Um, but this is an example of a project checklist and this is a BD and C with a healthcare directive, but you can see how um, how things are laid out. So, within location and transportation, you have a series of available credits. When you get into some of the others, like sustainable sites, water efficiency, you have required credits. The building is expected to meet a certain minimum as far as um, as what it's able to to do just as a basic building before you can take the next step and start looking at the points. And what you'll find is that the, each of the major categories does have a different set of information, like with the sustainable sites, um, it's kind of, it's one of the big ones with the difference between B, D and C and I, D and C. And then obviously operations and maintenance is going to be, you know, a different track than the, than the building ones. And then you get into innovation credits and regional priority credits. Um, and those are ones that can be sort of self-directed based on what you're, um, what you're able to provide and what, the, what, what is deemed as most necessary in the region that the building is. And then to lead online, this is kind of where the rabbit hole starts. You can find all of the 142,000 projects online um, if you, you know, so you can dig into the projects, you know, as deep as you want to go. There's a the project details. You can you can see the credits they got by credit, you know. So, you know, they you know so for Washington Adventist they didn't attempt the landscaping, um, you know, but they, you know, they they and they attempted these two and didn't get them, but they did get the building um, reduction in building equipment, but you can look for each of the different um, point brackets to see if, you know, if you're interested in that. Then you can also see a team list um, to see who all was on it if you're interested in that. And then you, but then you can also get the full, um, some of them have these full case studies that really go in depth in the project and are you know, really interesting and highlight a lot of information about you know what was done as well as all of the um all of the points and as you can see you know this one went for uh bd and c corn shell whereas this one where is it i think the uh lead for healthcare and so that come that's a little bit different with the different um versions in 2009 it was lead for healthcare or lead for schools things like that as opposed to um, uh, and then, you know, into, and then corn shell versus now with the 4.1 where, um, it's BD and C healthcare or ID and C healthcare. So they, they're tweaking them a little bit as they go along. Now on to kind of the, the meat of the discussion with the points for food service. Um, you know, as I kind of alluded to at the beginning, there still aren't as many points for food service as I think we as consultants would like there to be. Um, I attribute this somewhat to the fact that if you're working with an end user, they understand a 30% reduction in gas usage, a 30% reduction in electric usage, you know, that, you know, that your dishwasher is more efficient in water usage. And there's, you know, if you can get to them, that's enough of a carrot um, for them. They, 
I think it would be nice to see more points for food service to try to get the developers more on board and the people who don't have a operational cost consideration in the mix. Um, and then the other problem or the other challenge, I guess, with food service is that typically the energy um, is considered process energy because there aren't ASHRAE standards, um, although that is starting to change. And, um, you know, and the use of ENERGY STAR standards in, in place of ASHRAE is also start becoming, um, a, you know, a, a better way to use it. So um, I have been involved in one project in 15 years that actually did the, all of the required engineering calculations to not qualify the kitchen as process energy. And it is a very large and very complex spreadsheet. Um, but it was very interesting to see. And um, I was challenging a number of the manufacturers to, to track the information down. But I think we're all becoming smarter, which I think is a positive. Water use reduction is a requirement. Um, there are still kind of a limited number of items um, that use it, but they are, they are being smart about the items required. So like kitchen faucets, they, they want um, a flow rate less than 2.2 GPM. What's nice is they have been smart enough to exclude faucets that are used for filling. So you don't have to take a longer time to fill up your three compartment sink, um, which is nice to see because sometimes we do find these directives that aren't necessarily as well thought out. And then you get the pre rinse sprays, the ice, ice machines, and then um, lead B, BDNC for schools has um, delved a little bit deeper into the dishwashers, the food steamers, and the combination ovens. And what's interesting is, you know, again, thinking a little bit deeper, um, they also went to the water tempering. So if a jurisdiction requires that the hot water coming off of the dishwashers be tempered down to less than um, the temperature that it's coming off of or the steamers or the combis, um, that there is a attention paid to how much cool water is used for cooling that and when it's used, um, you know, and that it's not used when it's not needed. Um, and then, as I said, the Energy Star equipment is used as a baseline and a certain percentage of equipment is now typically required to be Energy Star. Um, Coffee brewers are one of the newer ones to the to the table with Energy Star ratings. So, but they are the um, kind of the only only the standard brewers. If you're not familiar with this new um, with this new category, so they're the bean to cup that are becoming so popular nowadays are, are do not have a category. They um, and the espresso machines don't either. And powdered coffee, liquid coffee, things like that that aren't from a loose ground um, origination are not, you know, they just, they don't have the designation set up yet. Then the dishwashers, the fryers, all the ones that I think a lot of people, who've, anyone who's dug, delved into this can, those are kind of the typical categories that have been around for a while. Um, although it is kind of interesting to see what does and does not have a designation. And again, it all comes down to what can they set a standard for and how do they hold a standard? So the other advantages of lead that um, that I that I've observed as um, you know outside of getting you know getting the coveted point in that column is you know as we all know and have talked to our clients about is the reduced operational costs and I think that that's you know something that maybe we can you know use lead to bring the attention of you know people that are not the operators whether they're the building owners the developers. Um, people who wouldn't necessarily be as concerned about an on, you know, the ongoing business expense. Um, rebates are becoming you know, more available. And so those are always you know, great to, to suggest to people. Um, and I think do help drive, the, um, drive some of the purchase decisions. And then you get into a little bit more of the um, you know, less bottom line, but still just as important. Um, you know, it demonstrates, you know, I think, you, you know, it demonstrates for both us as well as our clients that, you know, that they have a commitment to the social environmental requirements of, of being in the world and, you know, that they're not just looking to make 
a dollar at whatever costs. And then when you get into um, items that use, you know, that are more efficient providing heat, like induction, um, or more efficient fryers, or better insulated dishwashers, we're improving um, the the working conditions. And you know, everyone has their story of working in a hundred degree kitchen, and you know, or working in a steam bath. And so, as we continue to improve the equipment and continue to kind of work toward these, you know, understanding of what makes something a valuable lead part, we're, we're imp um, improving our conditions, our working conditions. And, um, you know, kind of going back to the uh, reduce the operational costs. So you know, as, you know, when you're looking at a lifespan of, you know, of five to 10 years, many of them can return um, an investment over time. So it's always good to, to understand when there's an, an ROI out there that you can point out to the client. And then the sustainability pieces that we're that we're seeing come into play that are outside of lead and um, and lead certification is the all electric kitchens. Uh, we were involved with a study, um, a global study for a, um, a tech company out of San Francisco that looked at the um, at what was required to move to all electric kitchens and what equipment was involved and if there was you know, what's available, what's more expensive. And it was um, really interesting because I think, um, you know, we've kind of heard that, you know, induction's more expensive or electric's more expensive than gas. But as, you know, I think we're, as we're seeing, a lot of those are coming down. Um, the local, the recent gas crunch not even being brought into uh, consideration. But, you know, we're, we're definitely seeing as things move to electric, that that um that the costs are coming down as far as purchase costs. We're also, I think, becoming more mindful of um, of uh, non-carbon uh, power and how electric. While some electricity is generated from carbon-based um, supplies, we're becoming much more able and uh, more efficient at getting the. Um, Re renewable, like, renewable energy, and you know, so solar, solar and wind and water, and the, so as we start to moving away from gas and into electric, where those will all start becoming you know, more in more demand, and also probably more, you know, should be more available. Then refrigerants, um, looking at moving to those with a lower um, greenhouse gas potential, like the R two nineties. The hydrocarbons that have become, um, you know, very available: R450A, R513A, and then the butane and isobutane. And then, you know, talking about carbon neutrals and net zeros and zero waste um, are all other sustainability things that we're that are pushing toward that um, aren't necessarily um, lead points for food service, but you do you get a really solid understanding getting a lead um, a lead AP or a green associate as far as kind of the new the new things that are out there and, and a, a better understanding. So the things that I have found for personal and professional advantages of lead is that um, we can get kind of you know focused on our little piece of the project and it really does offer um, a much wider view of projects particularly larger projects and all of the different components that go into it and you know understanding you know all you know just the amount of waste streams and trying to handle the waste streams coming out of a project and making sure that those are handled correctly so that you know, the wood is reclaimed and the plastic is reclaimed. And if you're tearing something out, can, you know, what can be done with it? Can the wiring be reused? Can the wiring be reclaimed? What, what all happens with that? And it's, um, you know, so it, there's a lot out there to, to learn and to understand. And it's a really kind of a deep dive into a lot of those. Um, 
And then I think it also indicates to our clients that that we do have a dedication to to a better world. You know, it's you know it's you know well beyond you know what you know what are you going to have for dinner? Where are you going for dinner? Who has the best burger? And the uh, once you're a lead professional and you're trying to look for the um, the the continuing education, you really are exposed to, again, you continue to be exposed to a wide variety of concepts. And my favorite that I've learned of this is the idea of biophilic design, which is where you they've taken something from nature to, um, to integrate into design that then makes the buildings better. And uh, you know, like discussions about what can we do to glass so that birds can see it? And how do we have buildings breathe more like organisms so that we're not having to use energy to, to move the air in and out? We can use you know, natural sources to, to make those things work. And you know, it's things like that where they're just not you know, necessarily on our radar as food service consultants. And then being able to talk about these topics also, I feel like offers, you know, when you're at a meeting or you're interacting with clients or potential clients um, in the built community, being able to talk about the same topics that they have are, is, um, you know, I think, you know, allows relationships to develop that, that might have struggled, you know, might have not been able to find a necessarily, you know, common ground, you know, outside of the typical, you know, sports or kids. And then, you know, I think that the, you know, growth of as an individual is always important. It's always, you know, challenge yourself and learn something new and learn something different. And, you know, don't necessarily become, you know, don't strive to be the expert on just one thing. You know, ex you know, expertise is important, but um, a broader understanding, I think as, you know, particularly as the world becomes more and more connected is so very important. And then we're gonna uh, finish up with the whole, with the idea of all of the other accreditations that are, that have been coming online. And this is only brushing the surface. Um, well is the, is the one that I think dovetails the best in with both lead and with what we're doing which um, deals with the health and well-being of the people. And it's a lot of it with us comes back into what type of food are you offering and how are you offering it? And so the idea being that the fruits and vegetables should be front and center, the fried foods should be less obvious. How do we, how do we help people be accidentally healthier, basically, as far as what we present? Um, the green, green classroom professional, the true, which is a, um, steps toward um, zero waste goals, cutting carbon footprints and public health. Edge, which is social, which is focused on social equity, and then the living building challenge. And then just thinking ahead of you all getting a set of. Uh, if you want a, a set of the of the slideshow, all of the different databases, like I said, um, LEAD and GBCI have an amazing amount of information on their website. Um, I mean, it's, you know, so I put kind of like the two, um, the, kind of the two ones that I, that I feel like are the most relevant here is uh, information about the credentials and then information about other projects so you can be, in, be inspired. Um, but they have a ton of information on their website. GBCI also has um, information, not just on LEED, but also on all of the other um, certificates like WELL and EDGE and FCSI just for good measure. And then the Living Building Challenge and then Energy Star. And then um, I was filling in some of these links and I'm sure you all have all of your own, but you know, Fishnick is one that I go to regularly, and then Lean Path are the are the two kind of non-organizational ones that that I find very helpful. 
And that leads us into Q&A. Okay, let me get my screen back up. So here's me. Um, so if you have questions, please feel free to put them down in the chat. I'm, I'm monitoring the chat. Q&A section on the Zoom. I am um, monitoring that so uh, I can I can give uh, questions over to Pam. Um, but we do have one from Kip. So he says, how do you put lead requirements into the, now here I'm going to show that I'm not a consultant, in the 11400. So you can tell there's, there's me showing that I do not do what you do. I run association. So, so 11, 4,000 is, okay, what, there we go. is what we call it. Um, the, what I found is that um, there's typically uh, lead requirements in, the, in section one. And so a reference back to section one um, or within the individual items, um, say, you know, either, you know, energy star um, or equivalent um, or, a specific requirement like the um, an aeration nozzle on the hand sinks. So typically digging a little bit deeper into the the actual individual specs for the equipment to, to make them meet the lead. Um, okay. Um, so yeah, go ahead. <laughs> And that, well, I've got the questions up too. Okay, so, so you uh, see them, then I don't need to jump in. I will just step out of this. Um, how do you obtain zero waste in a food service operation? Um, so zero waste doesn't mean that everything's consumed. It means that it's diverted from the landfill. And so zero waste does get more difficult in, um, in it. And it's a little, a little bit awfully topic, but you get into, you know, you get a little bit into the three R's with the number one being reduction because food waste is typically labor intensive and, and, and a labor issue. So you, you need to train your staff better, you know, make sure that they're using all of the pepper and not cutting the entire top off just because that's easier and throwing that away. Um, can you take the scraps um, from your vegetables and make a stock? Can you, is there a local pig farm that you can send your scraps to? Can you compost on site? Can you compost off site? So what you send to a comp what, what you're sending to compost is not considered waste because it is going, it, you know, it's going back into the circle. Um, you know, so then so then then you start getting into how are you receiving stuff? Um, you know, are you getting in a cardboard because you can recycle your cardboard? Or is it coming in a type, you know, is it coming in plastic film and can you recycle the plastic film somewhere around you? Or is it coming in something that is not recyclable? And if it's not recyclable, how do you move, how, how do you either move your supplier or move your, um, you know, move your supplier to provide it in, in something that can be recycled or reused or, or move to a different um, supplier that offers that. And so, you know, you have to start looking at what, you know, at, you know, at ways to, at ways to have the streams go a different direction. And so there are definitely, there are zero waste food service operations. Um, and there are some very minimal waste food service operations. And so it's really, um, you just have to kind of step back and take a different, take a different look at it. But the, you know, the, you know, the two, the first two R's are the big ones, you know, reduce the waste is, and then figure out how to um, reuse it in some other manner. Um, there is a, um, a school, I want to say it's Elizabethtown College in New Jersey, and um, that has an operation where they use a pulper and they pulp the food into one set of containers and the wastewater from, from the pulper into another set of containers. And the local farmer picks all of that up, takes it back to his cow farm, mixes it with manure, puts the liquids in an under um, an underground tank, harvests the methane, harvests the heat off of the compost, sells the compost, returns all of the power generated from the heat and the methane um, back to the grid, 
and fully powers this couple hundred acre farm and gets paid to pick up the food waste. So <laughs> there's there are creative ways to 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 deal with that. And hi to all of my friends out there. I see lots of uh, lots of uh, names that I recognize, and I yes. can't wait to see everybody again. Yes, yes, <laughs> that's exciting. I know. I agree with you. I can't wait to see them for the first time now uh, since I joined FCSI. Uh, so, if there are, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. If there aren't any other um, questions from the panelists, well, you actually, have I have a question a, to say. I, I I have a question for them. Yeah, okay. you know, if it, if they if they know now, they can answer now. Um, where where should this topic go that I didn't go? I was trying to make sure that I was addressing kind of a very very basic intro to this, but where where do we go next? And um, I'm sure that'll be a follow up question on the uh, on on the survey. But you know, if you can think of if you know where did you know if if you wish this went elsewhere or farther or deeper, what what topic would that be? Yeah, and I would like to throw that in as well. Um, I will ask that question of you. Uh, here's one from Scott. So what kind of time involvement is required to get to the different levels of accreditation? So I, um, I took it back at the very, very beginning and I was trying to remember exactly when, but it was, I wanna say somewhere around 2005. And so I took it when it was just AP and then I, and then they switched the test um, from the test that I took to another one that was reportedly very much hard, very hard. All right, let me try English again. Much harder than, than the one that was currently offered. So um, I took a six week course leading up to the test and it was about, I think it was like a two hours a week plus, um, you know, plus reading and study time. So that was probably, I'd say probably about five hours a week for that. Um, and then I took about another month of trying to study at home and doing the practice tests and, you know, completely freaking out with test anxiety. And I took it literally on the last day that it was offered before they went to the new one, because, you know, I have to have extreme pressure, evidently. Um, and I am one of those, I got 170 or I got 172 <laughs> and you need 170 to pass, but, you know, I've got that. And then I switched to the um, the AP designation, um, which requires you know the, it, it required 30 credit hours leading up to a certain date to um, be able to just switch into it. And so I did that, um, but that was really just the 30 credit hours. So it was really you know 30 35 hours. It was just the um, those. So um, and then somebody responded. I don't know if you said in the that's a study for the better part of six months. So um, so Jennifer, did you, um, did you take a course or did you do it on your own? Um, because like I said, I found the course to be very, very helpful. Um, yeah, so, um, I, I do feel like the course sped up my time. I don't, I, I don't think I would have been able to be as directed if I'd tried to do it on my own. Yes. And the practice tests are great. Um, so, and they are, you know there if you've taken any other certifications you know they're old they're old um questions and so you will absolutely get some of them um i think that if i knew ahead of time uh, what was required for the lead um doing doing the process energy uh spreadsheets i would have suggested that we charge the fee because it was probably 30 to 40 hours of my time to put a spreadsheet together on what was not a very large kitchen. Um, and actually, I'm trying to remember what project it was. It may have been Aventus that I put up here, but it was, um, and a lot of that came down to the, um, a lot of the manufacturers didn't even have the information that, that ASHRAE wanted in order to run all the calculations. And so it was a little bit of a, you know, a new experience for both myself and the engineers. So, um, but, you know, 
if you find out ahead of time that you are expected to um, to generate that level, um, then I, I think it's worthwhile. Um, for the other ones, I've um, I think most of us design try to design the most efficient project as a set standard. So you know, me adding aerators to my sinks to make sure that we meet the water reduction, or me using a an energy star um, you know, piece of equipment is pretty typical. Although I do find that not all quality models do carry the energy star designation, and so you know you wouldn't run into some, you know, odd things like, um, like ice makers. I've always been one of the ones where I've found that the ice makers I like have some quirk that makes them not fit in the category. You know, they're not, not energy star, but they don't fit the category. So they can't get the, the sticker. They can't get that little, they can't get the little blue square. Well, I will ask that question because um, I'll follow up with everyone to get some more um, steps because I do think this is something that, you know, we've come up with kind of thinking through how, what exactly what the title of the session was, how does the lead um, fit with, with what our consultants do and what, what can, you know, how can this fit with your practice as a food service consultant and why would you want you know, as we've discussed, why is this an important thing to know? Um, and also how we can connect FCSI to the other organizations too, to make um, that a little more worthwhile for us to talk beyond ourselves. So talk to other organizations and our architects and those kinds of um, relationships that we need to be building. Out of curiosity and click on the little raise hand, who's, who's lead certified or lead accredited? <laughs> a crush. So Jennifer. So Amy, I was like, Kip, you are right. Oh, okay. Um, so for so for the um one of the things that that Amy Stark and I have been talking about is um having the manufacturers offer um, lead points for their, um, for their presentations when they're doing, you know, because they're doing these, you know, broad, you know, non, uh, um, um, you know, they're having to talk about their, um, you know, how they're more efficient and more everything else. And, um, uh, you know, so it seems like they would just easily dovetail into what's required to be to get a lead CEO. So um, that's funny because we're seeing a bunch of them. But um, now that I'm working with a company headquartered out of California, um, I'm actually on two platinum projects, which, you know, like I said, I was kind of surprised. I'm on two platinum and a gold. And um, previously, I don't think I ever had two concurrent platinum projects. Hey, Amy, um, I actually set it up so that you can talk if you want to unmute, you can actually, um, instead of chatting, if you'd like to, um, to you know, add to, you, you're welcome to talk now. I've opened it up. Yeah, we're not seeing many lead projects in our neck of the woods, and you know, we do a ton of schools, and most of them are not. Going after the huh. That was one of the things that I noticed when I was looking through, I was trying to find some um, some snapshots from Lead Online. And when I sorted it by um, by newest certifications, it was like 80% schools. Yeah, but not here. We've got a couple, couple of reasons yeah. some of us are that difficult because we've been the last year or six. But sustainability practices I understand, oh yeah, let's expand our horizons and learn things, but 
I'd like to learn more about the future of things and the market mm -hmm. and all of that, not you know, throwing grains and new gardening. She <laughs> doesn't have nothing to do with me. But, um, yeah. And then the other thing I'm hoping is that we can get some of these engineers to listen in and have a clue and we don't have to like train the engineers every time we get somebody new on a food service project who's never done a food service project. Engineers have to be food So yeah, we're <laughs> yeah, I'd love to be a little more food service related and even if it's just water and things that are you are you finding that the schools are using um, the green schools directives, but just not paying the price for the actual certification? I don't even know. I don't even know if they're going that far. Um, there's one architect that we work with that has somebody that's really into this kind of thing on, on their staff, and another architect which, that we're doing the project with um, is, is going off the lead, but seriously, it's not. Not often. I can't tell you what time I'm going to do. Okay. Well, I'm going to. Uh, so we give one more chance for any other questions that might come in. If you want to raise your hand and actually ask the question instead of typing, I am more than happy to open it up. Um, but um, yeah, so one more chance for another set of questions. And I will give you a few more minutes, a few more seconds. That's uh, <laughs> your chance. Well, this has been really great. I appreciate everybody uh, for joining us today. It's been a great conversation, but it's also a great start to a longer conversation, I think, and some other work that FCSI will be doing um, in the future. And in the next in over the next year for sure so thank you again pam uh, for joining us and for leading our discussion and again thank you very much to marco beverage service system for sponsoring today's webinar i uh, will say our next uh, business essentials webinar will take place after our conference june 15th at 3 p.m eastern time um, we uh, don't forget that you can access all, again, the Business Essentials webinars on our website and that these do count for one CEU credit. And also, uh, don't forget to check out the On Tap podcasts that come out every other Tuesday. Uh, this week's episode is an interview with me. Uh, Wade and I are, are chatting this week. Yes. <laughs> Uh, and finally, I want to say we are so looking forward to seeing everybody at conference in Montreal, April 21st through the 23rd. And I just have breaking news. You'll all be getting an email shortly. Uh, as of April 1st, Canada will no longer require testing to get into the country. Um, right now, they're requiring a PCR test and they're, th those little hoops are now going away as of April 1st. And uh, we expect that if Canada, um, once Canada makes this announcement, that um, the US will probably follow suit. So uh, very good news for our travel to Canada. And um, a lot of the COVID restrictions that we've been thinking about and worrying about how are, are getting um, eliminated or softened in Canada. So we're really looking forward to an excellent conference. We have great registration numbers. Um, our events are coming together and they're going to be spectacular. So can't wait to see all of you in Montreal. So again, thank you, Pam. This has been great. Thank all of you uh, for joining us and we will see you. Uh, we'll see you in April. All right. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye.